Chapter Twenty Seven of Bow Brocade by Baroness Emma Orksey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Jock Miggs' errand. Master Mitchip had tried to utter one or two feeble protests, but Sir Humphrey had interrupted him emphatically the rascal may hope to win his pardon through the gascoigne influence by rendering her ladyship this service wherever he may be at this moment i am quite sure that his eye is upon me and my doings mitichip shuddered and closed his eyes he dared not peer into the dark scrub beside him and drew his horse in as close to sir humphreys as he could if you're afraid you lumbering old coward added his honour go back and leave me in peace i'll arrange my own affairs as i think best but the prospect of returning to brassington alone across this awful heath sent master mitichip into a renewed agony of terror though his noble patron seemed suddenly to have become uncanny in this inordinate lust for revenge he preferred his honour's company to his own and therefore made a violent effort to silence his worst fears the moor just now was comparatively calm the shouts of the hunters and the yelping of the hound had altogether ceased perhaps they had lost the scent another half-hour's silent ride brought them to the spur of the hill along the top of which ran the worksworth road and as they left the steep declivity behind them their ears were pleasantly tickled by the welcome and bucolic sound of the bleating of sheep your friend the shepherd seems to be at his post quoth sir humphrey with a sigh of satisfaction they were close to the point where on the previous night lady patience's coach had come to a halt and the next moment brought them in sight of the shepherd's hut with the pen beyond it vaguely discernible in the gloom sir humphrey gave the order to dismount master mitichip feeling more dead than alive had perforce to obey they tied their horses loosely to a clump of blackthorn by the roadside and then crept cautiously towards the hut it suited their purpose well that the night was a dark one the moon was not yet high in the heavens and was still half veiled by a thin film of fleecy clouds leaving the whole vista of the moor wrapped in mysterious grey-blue semitones you have brought the lanthorn whispered sir humphrey hurriedly yeah 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 yes your honour stammered mitichip then quick's the word said his honour pointing to a thick clump of gorse and bramble quite close to the shed the letters are in the very centre of that clump and only just below the surface do you creep in there and get them there was nothing for master mitichip to do but to obey and that with as much alacrity as his terror would allow his teeth were chattering in his head and his hands were trembling so violently that he was some time in striking a light for the lanthorn sir humphrey suppressed an oath of angry impatience lud preserve me murmured the poor attorney if that highwayman should come upon me whilst i am engaged in the task you you'll not leave me sir humphrey i'll lay my stick across your cowardly shoulders if you don't hurry was his honour's only comment he watched mitichip crawling on his hands and knees underneath the bramble and his deep stertorous breathing testified to the anxiety 
which was raging within him a few moments of intense suspense and then master midichip reappeared from beneath the scrub covered with wet earth still trembling but holding the packet of letters triumphantly in his hand sir humphrey snatched it from him quick find the shepherd now don't waste time he whispered pushing the cowering attorney roughly before him one feels as if every blade of grass had a pair of ears on this damned heath he muttered under his breath jock meggs the shepherd had counted over his sheep closed the gate of the pen and was just turning into the hut for the night when he was hailed by master midichip shepherd hey shepherd mids looked about him vaguely astonished since his adventure of the previous night when he had been made to play a tune for mad folks to dance to he felt that nothing would seriously surprise him when therefore he felt himself seized by the arm without more ado and dragged into the darkest corner of the hut he did not even protest did you wish to speak with me sir he asked plaintively rubbing his arm for sir humphrey's impatient grip had been very strong and hard yes said the latter speaking in a rapid whisper here's master midichip attorney-at-law whom you know well eh ay ay murmured jock meggs pulling at his forelock the sheep belong to his honour i believe exactly meggs interposed master midichip spurred to activity by a vigorous kick from sir humphrey and i have come out here on purpose to see you for it is very important that you should go at once on to worksworth for me with a packet and a note for master duffy my clerk what now this time of night quoth jock vaguely ay ay miggs you are not afraid are you sir humphrey had taken up his stand outside the hut leaving midichip to arrange this matter with the shepherd he had leaned his powerful frame against the wall of the shed and was grasping his heavily weighted riding crop ready and alert in case of attack the darkness round him at this moment was intense and his sharp eyes vainly tried to pierce the gloom which seemed to be closing in upon him but his ears were keenly alive to every sound which came to him out of the blackness of the night and all the while he tried not to lose one word of the conversation between midichip and the shepherd that's true jock the attorney was saying well then if you'll go to worksworth for me now at once there'll be a guinea for you a guinea came in bewildered accents from the worthy shepherd lordy lordy but these be mazing times all i want you to do jock is to take a packet for me to my house in fulsome street you understand but here there was a pause miggs was evidently hesitating well queried midichip i'm thinking sir what how can i go on your errand when i've got to guard this ere sheep for you oh damn the sheep quoth master midichip emphatically well sir if you be satisfied you know my house at worksworth ay ay sir i'll give you a packet you are to take it to worksworth now at once and to give it to my clerk master duffy at my house in fulsome street you are quite sure you understand i dunno as i do quoth jock vaguely but with an impatient oath sir humphrey turned into the hut matters were progressing much too slowly for his impatient temperament he pushed midichip aside and said peremptorily look here shepherd you want to earn a guinea don't you ay sir that i do well here's the packet 
and here's a letter for master duffy at master Midichip's house in Folsom street when master duffy has the packet and reads the letter he will give you a guinea is that clear and he handed the packet of letters and also a small note to jock miggs who seemed to have done with hesitation for he took them with alacrity oh ay that's clear enough he said tis writ in this paper that i'm to get the guinea in master mitichip's own hand but mind no gossiping and no loitering you must get to worksworth before cockcrow jock meggs slipped the packet and the note into the pocket of his smock the matter of the guinea having been satisfactorily explained to him he was quite ready to start noah for sure he said patting the papers affectionately mum's the word i'll do your bidding sir and the papers will be safe with me seeing it's writ on them that i'm to get a guinea exactly so you mustn't lose them you know no noah i bain't afeard of that nor of the highwaymen and bow brocade wouldn't touch the loiks of me bless em but lordy lordy these be mazing times already sir humphrey was pushing him impatiently out of the hut and here added his honour pressing a piece of money into the shepherd's hand here's a half-crown to keep you on the go thank ye sir and if you think the sheep will be all right oh hang the sheep all right sir if master mitichip be satisfied and i'll leave the dog to look after the sheep he took up his long knotted stick and still shaking his head and muttering lordy lordy the worthy shepherd slowly began to wend his way along the footpath which from this point leads straight to worksworth sir humphrey watched the quaint wizened figure for a few seconds until it disappeared in the gloom then he listened for a while all round him the heath was silent and at peace the plaintive bleating of the sheep in the pen added a note of subdued melancholy to the vast and impressive stillness only from far there came the weird echo of hound and men on the hunt his honour swore a round oath zounds he muttered the rogue must be hard pressed and he's not like to give us further trouble even if he come on us now eh you old scarecrow the letters are safe at last what lud preserve me sighed the attorney but i hope so back to brassington then quoth sir humphrey lustily bow brocade can attack us now eh ha 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 he laughed in his wonted boisterous way methinks we have outwitted that gallant highwayman after all for sure sir humphrey echoed mitichip who was meekly following his honour's lead across the road to where their horses were in readiness for them as for my lady patience ha said his honour jovially her brother's life is well in my hands to save or to destroy according as she will frown on me or smile but meseems her ladyship will have to smile eh he laughed pleasantly for he was in exceedingly good temper just now as for that chivalrous bow brocade he added as he hoisted himself into the saddle he shall and i mistake not dangle on a gibbet before another nightfall hark he added as the yelping of the bloodhound once more woke the silent moor with its eerie echo mitichip's scanty locks literally stood up beneath his bobtail wig even sir humphrey could not altogether repress a shudder as he listened to the shouts the cries the snarls which were rapidly drawing nearer we should have waited to be in at the death he said with enforced gaiety meseems our fox is being run to earth at last he tried to laugh but his laughter sounded eerie and unnatural and suddenly 
it was interrupted by the loud report of a pistol shot followed by what seemed like prolonged yells of triumph master mitichip could bear it no longer with the desperation of intense and unreasoning terror he dug his spurs into his horse's flanks and like a madman galloped at breakneck speed down the hillside into the valley below sir humphrey followed more leisurely he had gained his end and was satisfied end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of bow brocade by baroness emma orksey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the quarry some few minutes before this the hunted man had emerged upon the road as worn out pallid aching in every limb he dragged himself wearily forward on hands and knees it would have been difficult to recognize in this poor suffering fragment of humanity the brilliant dashing gentleman of the road the foppish light-hearted dandy whom the countryside had nicknamed beau brocade the wound in his shoulder inflamed and throbbing after the breakneck ride from the courthouse to the heath had caused him almost unendurable agony against which he had at first resolutely set his teeth but now his whole body had become numb to every physical sensation covered with mud and grime his hair matted against his damp forehead the lines of pain and exhaustion strongly marked round his quivering mouth he seemed only to live through his two senses his sight and his hearing the spirit was there though indomitable strong the dog obstinacy of the man who has nothing more to lose and with it all the memory of the oath he had sworn to her all else was a blank hunted by men and with a hound on his track he had physically become like the beasts of the moor alert to every sound keen only on eluding his pursuers on putting off momentarily the inevitable instant of capture and of death early in the day he had been forced to part from his faithful companion jack-o'-lantern was exhausted and might have proved an additional source of danger the gallant beast accustomed to every bush and every corner of the heath knew its way well to its habitual home the forge of john stitch jack bathurst watched it out of sight content that it would look after itself and that being riderless it would be allowed to wend its way unmolested whither it pleased on the moor and thus he had seen the long hours of this glorious september afternoon drag on their weary course he had seen the beautiful day turn to late glowing afternoon then the sun gradually set in its mantle of purple and gold and finally the gray dusk throw its elusive and mysterious veil over tors and moor and he like the hunted beast crept from gorse bush to scrub hiding for his life driven out of one stronghold into another gasping with thirst panting with fatigue determined in spirit but broken down in body at last by instinct and temperament jack bathurst was essentially a brave man physical fear was entirely alien to his nature he had never known it never felt it during the earlier part of the afternoon with a score of men at his heels some soldiers others but indifferently equipped louts he had really enjoyed the game of hide-and-seek on the heath to him at first 
it had been nothing more it was but a part of that wild mad life he had chosen the easily endured punishment for the breaking of conventional laws he knew every shrub and crag on this wild corner of the earth which had become his home and could have defied a small army when hidden in the natural strongholds known only to himself but when he first heard the yelping of the bloodhound set upon his track by the fiendish cunning of an avowed enemy an icy horror seemed to creep into his very marrow a horror born of the feeling of powerlessness of the inevitableness of it all his one thought now was lest his hand trembling and numb with fatigue would refuse him service when he would wish to turn the muzzle of his pistol against his own temple in order to evade actual capture the dog would not miss him it was practically useless to hide flight alone constant ceaseless flight might help him for a while but it was bound to end one way and one way only the scent of blood would lead the cur on his track and his pursuers would find and seize him bind him like a felon and hang him ay hang him like a common thief he had oft laughed and joked with john stitch about his ultimate probable fate he knew that his wild unlawful career would come to an end sooner or later but he always carried pistols in his belt and had not even remotely dreamt of capture until now but now he was tired ill half paralyzed with pain and exhaustion his trembling hand crept longingly round the heavy silver handle of the precious weapon every natural instinct in him clamoured for death now at this very moment before that yelping cur drew nearer before those shouts of triumph were raised over his downfall only after that what would happen he would be asleep and at peace but she what would she think that like a coward he had deserted his post like a felon he had broken his oath whilst there was one single chance of fulfilling it that he had left her at the mercy of that same enemy who had already devised so much cruel treachery and like a beast he crept back within his lair and watched and listened for that one chance of serving her before the end he had seen sir humphrey challoner and midichip ambling up the hillside he tried not to lose sight of them and if possible to keep within earshot but he was driven back by a posse of his pursuers close upon his heels and now having succeeded in reaching the road at last he had the terrible chagrin of seeing that he was too late the two men were remounting their horses and turning back towards brassington methinks we have outwitted that gallant highwayman after all sir humphrey was saying with one of those boisterous outbursts of merriment which to bathurst's sensitive ears had a ring of the devil's own glee in it what hellish mischief have those two reprobates been brewing i wonder he mused if those fellows at my heels hadn't cut me off i might have known he crept nearer to the two men but they set their horses at a sharp trot down the road jack vainly strained his ears to hear their talk for the last eight hours he had practically covered every corner of the heath backwards and forwards across boulders and through morass the hound had had some difficulty in finding and keeping the trail but now it seemed suddenly to have found it the yelping drew nearer but the shouts had altogether ceased 
what was to be done god in heaven what was to be done it was at this moment that the plaintive bleating of one or two of the penned-up sheep suddenly aroused every instinct of vitality in him the sheep he murmured a receipt and tally for some sheep fresh excitement had in the space of a few seconds given him a new lease of strength he dragged himself up to his feet and walked almost upright as far as the hut there certainly was a flock of sheep in the pen the dog was watching close by the gate but the shepherd was nowhere to be seen the sheep a receipt and tally for some sheep in sir humphrey challoner's coat pocket oh for one calm moment in which to think to think the sheep this one thought went on hammering in the poor tired brain like the tantalizing elusive whisper of a mischievous sprite and with it all there was scarce a second to be lost the hound yelping and straining on the leash was not half a mile away the next ten or perhaps fifteen minutes would see the end of this awful manhunt on the moor and yet there close by behind those clumps of gorse and the thick-set hedge of bramble was the clearing where just twenty-four hours ago he had danced that mad rigadoon with her almost in his arms instinctively in the wild agony of this supreme moment beau brocade turned his steps thither this clearing had but two approaches there where the tough branches of firs had once been vigorously cut into last night he had led her through the one whilst jock miggs sat beside the other piping the quaint sad tune for one moment the hunted man seemed to live that mad merry hour again and from out the darkness fairy fingers seemed to beckon and her face just for one brief second smiled at him out of the gloom surely this was not to be the end something would happen something must happen to enable him to render her the great service he had sworn to do oh if that yelping dog were not quite so close upon his track within the next few minutes seconds even he would surely think of something that would guide him towards that great goal her service oh for just a brief respite in which to think a way to evade his captors for a short while a means to hide a disguise anything but for once the more his happy home his friend his mother was silent save for the sound of hunters on his trail of his doom drawing nearer and nearer whilst he stood and remembered his dream it was madness surely or else a continuance of that fairy vision but now it seemed to him as he stood just there where yesterday her foot had plied the dear old measure that his ear suddenly caught once more the sound of that self-same rigadoon it was a dream of course he knew that and paused a while although every second now meant life or death to him the tune seemed to evade him it had been close to his ear a moment ago now it was growing fainter and fainter gradually vanishing away soon he could scarce hear it yet it seemed something tangible something belonging to her it was the tune which she had loved to which her foot had danced so gladsomely so he ran after it ran as fast as his weary body would take him to the further end of the clearing whither the sweet sad tune was leading him with its tender plaintive echo there just where the clearing debouched upon the narrow path 
which leads to worksworth he overtook jock miggs who was slowly wending his way along and who just now must have passed quite close to him blowing on his tiny pipe as was his wont the shepherd chorus of angels in paradise lend me your aid now with a supreme effort he pulled his scattered senses together the mighty fever of self-defence was upon him that tower of strength which some overwhelming danger will give to a brave man once perhaps in his lifetime the veil of semi-consciousness of utter physical prostration was lifted from his dull brain for this short brief while the exhausted suffering hunted creature had once more given place to the keen alert son of the moor the mad free child of nature with a resourceful head and a daring hand and for that same brief while the great and mighty power whom men have termed fate but whom saints have called god allowed his untamed spirit to conquer his body and to hold it in bondage chasing pain away trampling down exhaustion whilst disclosing to his burning eyes amidst the dark and deadly gloom the magic golden vision of a newly awakened hope End of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of bow brocade by baroness emma orksey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the dawn a while ago in an agony of longing he had cried out for a moment's respite for a disguise and now there stood before him jock miggs in smock and broad-brimmed hat with pipe and shepherd's staff his pursuers headed by the yelping dog were still a quarter of a mile away five minutes in which to do battle for his life for his freedom for the power to keep his oath the plan of action had surged in his mind at first sight of the wizened little figure of the shepherd beside the further approach to the clearing beau brocade drew himself up to his full height sought and found in the pocket of his coat the black mask which he habitually wore this he fixed to his face then drawing a pistol from his belt he overtook jock miggs clapped him vigorously on the shoulder and shouted lustily stand and deliver jock miggs aroused from his pleasant meditations threw up his hands in terror the lud have mercy on my soul he ejaculated as he fell on his knees stand and deliver repeated beau brocade in as gruff a voice as he could command jock miggs was trying to collect his scattered wits but 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 kind sir he murmured you 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 wouldn't harm jock miggs the shepherd would you quick's the word now then but good sir oi oi i've got nout to deliver jock miggs was pitiful to behold at any other moment of his life bathurst would have felt very sorry for the poor scared creature but that yelping hound was drawing desperately near and he had only a few minutes at his command not to deliver he said with a great show of roughness and seizing poor jock by the collar look at your smock my smock kind sir ay i've a fancy for your smock so off with it quick jock miggs struggled up to his feet he was beginning to gather a small modicum of courage he had lived all his life on brassing moor and it was his first serious encounter with an armed gentleman of the road 
whether twas beau brocade or no he was too scared to conjecture but he had enough experience of the heath to know that poor folk like himself had little bodily hurt to fear from highwaymen but of course it was always wisest to obey as to his old smock <laughs> he 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 my old smock sir he laughed vaguely and nervously why i don't want to knock the poor old cuckoo down murmured bathurst to himself but i've just got three minutes before that cur reaches the top of the clearing and off with your smock man or i fire he added peremptorily and pointing the muzzle of his pistol at the trembling shepherd meggs had in the meanwhile fully realized that the masked stranger was in deadly earnest why he should want the old smock was more than any shepherd could conceive but that he meant to have it was very clear jock uttered a final plaintive word of protest kind sir but if i take off my smock i shan't be quite the the decent sir with only my shirt you shall have my coat replied bathurst decisively lud preserve me your coat sir yes it's old and shabby and my waistcoat too now off with that smock or once more the muzzle of the pistol gleamed close to jock miggs head without further protest he began to divest himself of his smock the process was slow and laborious and jack set his teeth not to scream with the agony of the suspense he himself had had little difficulty in taking off his own coat and waistcoat for earlier in the day before he had been so hard pressed the pain in his shoulder had caused him to slip his left arm out of its sleeve moreover the excitement of these last fateful moments kept him at fever pitch he was absolutely unconscious of aught save of the rapid flight of the seconds and the steady approach of dog and men towards the clearing even jock miggs who up to now had been too intent on his own adventure to take much heed of what went on in the gloom beyond even he perceived that something unusual was happening on the moor what's that he asked with renewed terror a posse of soldiers at my heels said beau brocade decisively that's why i want your smock my man and if i don't get it there will be just time to blow out your dull brains before i fall into their hands this last argument was sufficiently convincing miggs thought it decidedly best to obey he helped his mysterious assailant on with his own smock cap and kerchief and not unwillingly attired himself in beau brocade's discarded coat and waistcoat a pistol in your belt in case you need it friend whispered bathurst rapidly as he slipped one of the weapons in miggs belt keeping the other firmly grasped in his own hand there was no doubt that the hound was on the scent now the men had ceased shouting but their rapid footsteps could be heard following closely upon the dog whose master was muttering a few words of encouragement anon there came a whisper louder than the rest this way then another there's a path here beguy this confounded darkness steady roy steady old man eh what this way can't you find the trail old roy and the gorse was crackling beneath rapid and stealthy footsteps there was now just the width of the clearing between beau brocade and his pursuers this way sergeant roy's got the trail again 
neither jock miggs nor yet bow brocade could see what was going on at the further end of the clearing the dog wildly straining against the leash was quivering with intense excitement his master hanging on to him with all his might miggs scared like some sheep lost among a herd of cows was standing half dazed smoothing down with appreciative fingers the fine cloth of his new apparel terrified every time his hand came in contact with the pistol in his belt but beau brocade had crept underneath a heavy clump of gorse and bramble and with his finger on the trigger of his weapon he cowered there ready for action his eyes fixed upon the blackness before him the next moment the outline of the hound's head and shoulders became faintly discernible in the gloom with nose close to the ground powerful jaws dropping and parched tongue hanging out of its mouth it was heading straight for the clump of gorse where cowered the hunted man beau brocade took rapid aim and fired the dog without a howl rolled over on its side whilst jock miggs uttered a cry of terror then there was an instant's pause the pursuers silenced and awed had stopped dead for they had been taken wholly unawares and for a second or two waited expecting and dreading yet another shot then a mild trembling voice came to them from the darkness there he is sergeant just afore you standing see the sergeant and soldiers had no need to be told twice their pause had only been momentary and already they had perceived the outline of jock miggs figure standing motionless not far from the body of the dead dog with a shout of triumph sergeant and soldiers fell on the astonished shepherd whilst the same mild trembling voice continued to pipe excitedly hold him tight sergeant jump on him tie his legs sure and tis he the rascal jock miggs had had no chance of uttering one word of protest for one of the soldiers remembering a lesson learnt the day before at the smithy had thrown his own heavy coat right over the poor fellow's head effectually smothering his screams another man had picked up the still smoking pistol from the ground close to miggs feet pistols said the sergeant excitedly the pair of them too he added pulling the other silver mounted weapon out of miggs belt and the black mask out of the pocket of his coat and silver mounted be guy and his mask now my men off with him tie his legs together off with your belts quick and you corporal keep that coat tied well over his head the rascals like an eel and will wiggle out of your hands if you don't hold him tight remember there's a hundred guineas reward for the capture of beau brocade poor old miggs smothered within the thick folds of the soldier's coat could scarce manage to breathe the men were fastening his knees and ankles together with their leather belts his arms too were pinioned behind his back thus trussed and spitted like a goose ready for roasting he felt himself being hauled up on the shoulders of some of the men and then borne triumphantly away we've gotten beau brocade hip hip hooray and so they marched away shouting lustily whilst beau brocade remained alone on the heath the excitement was over now he was safe for the moment and free but the hour of victory seemed like the hour of death as the last shouts of triumph the last cry of hooray died away in the distance 
he fell back against the wet earth his senses were reeling the very ground seemed to be giving way beneath his feet a lurid red film to be rising before his closing lids blotting out the darkness of the moor and that faint very faint streak of grey which had just appeared in the east god to whom he had cried out in his agony had given him the respite for which he had craved he was safe and free to think to think of her and yet now his one longing seemed to be to lie down and rest and rest and sleep many a night he had lain thus on the open moor with the soft sweet-scented earth for his bed and the tender buds of heather as a pillow for his head but to-night he was only conscious of infinite peace and his trembling hands drew the worthy shepherd's smock closer round him his wandering spirit paused a while to dwell on poor miggs in his sorry plight ah well the morning would see jock free again but in the meanwhile then all of a sudden the spirit was back on earth back to life and to a mad scarce understandable hope his hand had come in contact with a packet of letters in the pocket of miggs smock far away in the sky the eastern stars had paled before the morning light one by one the distant peaks of the derbyshire hills emerged from the black mantle of the night and peeped down on the valley below blushing a rosy red upon the heath animal life began to be astir in the morass beyond a lazy frog started to croak bow brocade had clasped the letters with cold numb fingers he drew them forth and held them before his dimmed eyes the letters he murmured trembling with the agony of this great unlooked-for joy the letters how they came there he could not tell he was too weary too ill to guess but that they were her letters he could not for a moment doubt he had found them god and his angels had placed them in his hands ah fortune fickle fortune the wilful jade and the poor outlaw were to be even then after all and twas beau brocade highwayman thief who was destined in a few hours to bring her this great happiness will she will she smile i wonder he loved to see her smile and to watch the soft tell-tale blush slowly mounting to her cheek ah now he was dreaming dreams that never never could be he would bring her back the letters for he had sworn to her that she should have them ere the sun had risen twice over yon green-clad hills and then all would be over and she would pass out of his life like a beautiful comet gliding across the firmament of his destiny a moment but not to stay in the east far away rose had changed to gold from moor and heath and bogland came the sound of innumerable bird throats singing the great and wonderful hymn of praise hosanna to awakening nature the outlaw had kept his oath he turned to where the first rays of the rising sun shed their shimmering mantle over the distant tors and in one great uplifting of his soul to his maker he prayed that sweet death might kiss him when he placed the letters at her feet End of chapter 29chapter thirty of bow brocade by baroness emma orksey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah suspense 
throughout the whole range of suffering which humanity is called upon to endure there is perhaps nothing so hard to bear as suspense the uncertainty of what the immediate future might bring the fast sinking hope the slowly creeping despair the agony of dull weary hours patience had gone through the whole miserable gamut during that long and terrible day when obedient to bathurst's wishes she had shut herself up in the dingy little parlor of the pack-horse and refused to see any one save the faithful smith and the news which john stitch brought to her from time to time was horrible enough to hear he tried to palliate as much as possible the account of that awful battue organized against beau brocade but she guessed from the troubled look on the honest smith's face and from the furtive anxious glance of his eyes that the man whom she had trusted with her whole heart was now in peril even more deadly than that which had assailed her brother and with the innate sympathy born of a true and loving heart she guessed too how john stitch's simple faithful soul went out in passionate longing to his friend who alone wounded perhaps helpless was fighting his last battle on the heath yet the trust within her had not died out beau brocade had sworn to do her service and to bring her back the letters ere the sun had risen twice over the green-clad hills to her overwrought mind it seemed impossible that he should fail he was not the type of man whom fate or adverse circumstance ever succeeded in conquering and on his whole magnetic personality on the intense vitality of his being nature had omitted to put the mark of failure but the hours wore on and she was without further news her terror for her brother increased the agony of her suspense she could see that john stitch too had become anxious about philip there was no doubt that with an organized manhunt on the moor the lonely forge by the crossroads would no longer be a safe hiding-place for the earl of stretton the smithy was already marked as a suspected house and john stitch was known to be a firm adherent of the gascoignes and a faithful friend of beau brocade during the course of this eventful day the attention of the sergeant and soldiers had been distracted through bathurst's daring actions from stitch's supposed nephew out of nottingham but as the beautiful september afternoon turned to twilight and then to dusk and band after band of hunters set out to scour the heath it became quite clear both to patience and to the smith that philip must be got away from the forge at any cost he could remain in temporary shelter at the pack-horse under the guise of one of lady patience's serving men at any rate until another nightfall when a fresh refuge could be found for him according as the events would shape themselves within the next few hours therefore as soon as the shadows of evening began to creep over brassing moor stitch set out for the cross-roads he walked at a brisk pace along the narrow footpath which led up to his forge his honest heart heavy at thought of his friend all alone out there on the heath the weird echo of the manhunt did not reach this western boundary of the moor but even in its stillness the vast immensity looked hard and cruel in the gloom the outlines of gorse bush and blackthorn seemed akin to gaunt 
cassandra-like spectres foreshadowing some awful disaster within the forge philip too had waited in an agony of suspense whilst twice the glorious sunset had clothed the tors with gold driven by hunger and cold out of the hiding-place on the moor which bathurst had found for him he had returned to the smithy the first night only to find john stitch gone and no trace of his newly found friend his sister he knew must have started for london but he was without any news as to what had happened in the forge and ignorant of the gallant fight made therein by the notorious highwayman the hour was late then and philip was loth to disturb old mistress stitch john's mother who kept house for him at the cottage moreover he had the firm belief in his heart that neither bathurst nor stitch would have deserted him had they thought that he was in imminent danger tired out with the excitement of the day and with a certain amount of hope renewed in his buoyant young heart he curled himself up in a corner of the shed and forgot all his troubles in a sound sleep the next morning found him under the care of old mistress stitch at the cottage she had had no news of john who had wandered out so she said about two hours after sunset possibly to find the captain but she thrilled the young man's ears with the account of the daring fight in the forge nay but they'll never get our captain said the worthy dame with a break in her gentle old voice and if the whole countryside was after him they'd never get him leastwise so says my john god grant he may speak truly replied the young man fervently tis shame enough on me that a brave man should risk his life for me whilst i have to stand idly behind a cupboard door the absence of definite news weighed heavily upon his spirits and as the day wore on and neither john stitch nor bathurst reappeared his hopes very quickly began to give way to anxiety and then to despair philip always had a touch of morbid self-analysis in his nature unlike jack bathurst he was ever ready to bend the neck before untoward fate heaping self-accusation on self-reproach and thus allowing his spirit to bow to circumstance rather than to attempt to defy it and throughout the whole of this day he sat moody and silent with the ever-recurring thought hammering in his brain i ought not to have allowed a stranger to risk his life for me i should have given myself up twas unworthy a soldier and a gentleman by the time the shadows had lengthened on the moor and jack-o'-lantern covered with sweat had arrived riderless at the forge philip was formulating wild plans of going to worksworth and there surrendering himself to the local magistrate he worked himself up into a fever of heroic self-sacrifice and had just resolved only to wait until dawn to carry out his purpose when john stitch appeared in the doorway of his smithy one look in the honest fellow's face told the young earl of stretton that most things in his world were amiss just now a few eager questions and as briefly as possible stitch told him exactly how matters stood the letters stolen by sir humphrey challoner bathurst's determination to recapture them and the organized hunt proceeding this very night against him 
her ladyship and i both think my lord that this place is not safe for you just now added john finally and she begs you to come to her at brassington as soon as you can the road is safe enough added the smith with a heavy sigh no one would notice us they are all after the captain and god knows but perhaps they've got him by now philip could say nothing for his miserable self-reproaches had broken his spirit of obstinacy his boyish heart was overflowing with sympathy for the kindly smith how gladly now would he have given his own life to save that of his gallant rescuer obediently he prepared to accede to his sister's wishes he knew what agony she must have endured when the letters were filched from her he guessed that she would wish to have him near her and in any case he wanted to be on the spot hoping that yet he could offer his own life in exchange for the one which was being so nobly risked for him quite quietly therefore and without a murmur he prepared to accompany stitch back to brassington at the pack-horse a serving man's suit could easily be found for him and he would be safe enough there for a little while at least john stitch having tended jack-o'-lantern with loving care took a hasty farewell of his mother while his friend's fate and that of his young lord hung in the balance he was not like to get back quietly to his work the captain may come back here for shelter mayhap he said with a catch in his throat as he kissed the old dame good-bye you'll tend to him mother ay you may be sure of that john replied mistress stitch fervently he'll need a rest mayhap and some nice warm water he's such a dandy mother you know ay ay and you might lay out his best clothes for him he may need them mayhap ay i've got em laid in lavender for him that nice sky-blue coat think you john ay and the fine broidered waistcoat and the black silk bow for his hair and the lace ruffles for his wrists and stitch broke down a great lump had risen in his throat would the foppish young dandy the handsome light-hearted gallant ever gladden the eyes of honest john again End of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of bow brocade by baroness emma orksey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah we've gotten bow brocade the presence of philip at the inn had done much to cheer patience in her weary waiting he and john stitch had reached the pack-horse some time before cock-crow and the landlord had been only too ready to do anything in reason to further the safety of the fugitive so long as his own interests were not imperilled thereby this meant that he would give philip a serving man's suit and afford him shelter in the inn for as long as the authorities did not suspect him of harboring a rebel beyond that he would not go lady patience had paid him lavishly for this help and his subsequent silence it was understood that the fugitive would only make a brief halt at brassington some more secluded shelter would have to be found for him on the morrow for the moment of course the thoughts of every one in the village would be centred in the capture of bow brocade the highwayman had many friends and adherents in the village people whom his careless and open-handed generosity had often saved from penury to a man almost the village folk hoped to see him come out victorious 
from the awful and unequal struggle which was going on on the heath so strong was this feeling that the beetle who was known to entertain revengeful thoughts against the man who had played him so impudent a trick the day before did not dare to show his rubicund face in the bar parlor of either inn on that memorable night no one had gone to bed the men waited about consuming tankards of small ale whilst discussing the possibility of their hero's capture the women sat at home with streaming eyes plaintively wondering who would help them in future in their distress if beau brocade ceased to haunt the heath patience herself did not close an eye her hand clinging to that of philip she sat throughout that long weary night watching and waiting dreading the awful dawn with the terrible news it would bring and it was when the first rosy light shed its delicate hue over the tiny old-world village that the sweet-scented morning air was suddenly filled with the hoarse triumphal cry we have gotten beau brocade hip 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 hooray wearied and dazed with the fatigue of her long vigil patience had sunk into a torpor when those shouts rapidly drawing nearer to the village roused her from this state of semi-consciousness she hardly knew what she had hoped during these past anxious hours now that the awful certainty had come it seemed to stun her with the unexpectedness of the blow we've gotten beau brocade the village folk turned out in melancholy groups from the parlor of the inn they too had entertained vague hopes that their hero would emerge unscathed from the perils which encompassed him to them too the news of his capture came as that of a sad irretrievable catastrophe they congregated in small excited numbers on the village green their stolid heads shaking sadly at sight of the squad of soldiers who were bringing in a swathed up bundle of humanity smothered about the head in a scarlet coat and with hands and legs securely strapped down with a couple of military belts only the fine brown cloth coat the beautifully embroidered waistcoat and silver mounted pistol proclaimed that miserable helpless bundle to be the gallant beau brocade the soldiers themselves were in a wild state of glee they had carried their prisoner in triumph all the way from the heath and had never ceased shouting until they had deposited him on the green owing to the unusual hour and to the absence of his honour squire west the pinioned highwayman was to be locked up in the pound until noon in the small private parlour of the pack-horse patience had sat rigid as a statue while those shouts of triumph seemed to strike her heart as with a hammer her fist pressed against her burning mouth she was making desperate efforts to smother the scream of agony which would have rent her throat but with one bound john stitch was soon out of the pack-horse where he too with aching heart and mind devoured with anxiety had watched and waited through the night it did not take him long to reach the green and using his stalwart elbows to some purpose he quickly made a way for himself through the small crowd and was presently looking down on the huddled figure which lay helpless on the ground there was the captain's fine brown coat sure enough with its ample silk lined full skirts and rich cut steel buttons there was the long richly embroidered waistcoat the lace cuffs at the wrists and the handsome sword-belt through which the finely chased 
silver handle of the pistol still protruded but john stitch had need but to cast one glance at the hands and another at the feet encased in rough countryman's boots to realize with a sudden wild exultation of his honest heart that in some way or other his captain had succeeded in once more playing a trick on his pursuers and that the man who lay there muffled on the ground was certainly not beau brocade but even in the suddenness of this intense joy and relief john stitch was shrewd enough not to betray himself obviously every moment during which the captors enjoyed their mistaken triumph was a respite gained for the hunted man out on the heath therefore when the sergeant ordered the rascal to be locked up in the pound awaiting his honour's orders and gave stitch a vigorous rap on the shoulder saying lustily well master stitch we've got your friend after all you see the smith quietly replied ay ay you've gotten him right enough no offence sergeant have a small ale with me before we all go to bed tis nought to me he added seeing with intense satisfaction the heavy bolts of the pound securely pushed home on the unfortunate jock miggs the sergeant was nothing loth and eagerly followed stitch to the bar of the royal george where small ale now flowed freely until the sun was high in the heavens but as soon as the smith had seen the soldiers safely installed before their huge tankards he rushed out of the inn and across the green back to the pack-horse to bring the joyful news to lady patience and her brother in the privacy of the little back parlour he was able to give free rein to his joy they'll never get the captain he shouted tossing his cap in the air and saving your ladyship's presence we was all fools to think they would patience had said nothing when the smith first brought the news she smiled kindly and somewhat mechanically at the exuberance of his joy but when honest john once more left her to glean more detailed account of the great manhunt on the heath she turned to her brother and falling on her knees she buried her fair head against the lad's shoulder and sobbed in the fullness of her joy as if her heart would break End of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of beau brocade by baroness emma orksey this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A painful incident. A few hours later, when hunters and watchers had had a little rest, came the rude awakening after the hour of triumph. Jock Miggs, still trussed and pinioned, had been hauled out of the pound master inch the beetle resplendent in gold-laced coat and the majesty of his own importance had taken the order of ceremony into his own hands his honour squire west would be round at the court-house about noon and inch still smarting under the indignity put upon him through the instrumentality of the highwayman had devised an additional little plan of revenge sir humphrey challoner had emphatically declared that the beetle should be publicly whipped for having dared to lay hands on the squire of hardington's person master inch remembered this possible and appalling indignity which mayhap he would be called upon to suffer and therefore when the bolts of the pound were first drawn disclosing the swathed up bundle of humanity which was supposed to be the highwayman 
the beetle shouted in his most stentorian most pompous tones to the pond with him the soldiers most of them lads recruited from the midland counties and a pretty rough lot to boot were only too ready for this additional bit of horseplay twas fun enough to sit an old scold in the ducking stool but to carry on the same game with beau brocade the notorious highwayman who had defied the four counties and set every posse of soldiers by the ears would be rare sport indeed with a shout of joy they seized jock miggs by the legs and shoulders and with much laughter and many a lively sally they carried him to the shallow duck pond at the further end of the green very sadly and with many an anxious shake of the head the village folk followed the little procession which was headed by the sergeant and pompous master inch at the moment when the unfortunate shepherd was being swung in mid-air preparatory to his immersion in the water one of the soldiers laughingly dragged away the coat which swathed poor mig's head and shoulders and was near suffocating him we don't want him to drown do we he said just as his comrades dropped the wretched man straight into the pond immediately there was a loud cry from beetle and spectators lord love us all that vain bow brocade and one timid voice added why tis jock miggs the shepherd the beetle nearly had a fit of apoplectic rage that cursed highwayman surely must be in league with the devil himself the soldiers were gasping with astonishment and staring open-mouthed at the dripping figure of jock miggs who with unruffled stolidity was quietly struggling out of the water lordy lordy these be mazing times he muttered in his vague fatalistic way as he shook himself dry in the sunshine after the manner of his own woolly sheep-dog oh ho ho ha 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 came in merry chorus from the crowd of village folk look at jock miggs the highwayman the soldiers were absolutely speechless master inch the beetle had said emphatically damn truly there was nothing more to be said those who were inclined to be superstitious felt convinced that the devil himself had had something to do with this amazing substitution that it was beau brocade who had been captured on the heath last night none of those who were present at the time doubted for a single instant to their minds the highwayman had been mysteriously spirited away by the agency of satan his friend who had quietly deposited jock miggs the shepherd in his place john stitch with mistress betty beside him had watched these proceedings from the other end of the green fully prepared to come to miggs's assistance and to disclose the latter's identity at once if the horse-play became at all too rough he now pushed his way through the group of soldiers and good-naturedly taking hold of the bewildered shepherd's arm he led him to the porch of the royal george you'd like to wet your gullet after this eh jock he said as he ordered a tankard of steaming ale to be brought forthwith to the dripping man the soldiers somewhat shamefaced had pressed into the bar parlor of the inn presently there would be a few broken heads in the village as a result of the morning's work but for the moment the yokels had not begun to chafe twas jock who was the centre of attraction outside in the porch sitting on a bench and sipping large quantities of hot ale let's all drink a glass of ale 
to the health of jock miggs the highwayman came in merry accents from one of the gaffers hooray for jock miggs the highwayman was the universal gleeful chorus be guy don't he look formidable quoth one of the villagers pointing at the shepherd's scared figure on the bench let me perish said another in mock alarm but i's mightily afeard of him mistress betty too had mixed with the throng and was eyeing jock with irrepressible laughter dancing in her saucy little face lud tis that funny bit of sheep's wool she said gaily faith and you do look sadly jock miggs and no mistake have you been in the pond how did he found that out queried miggs vaguely ay they dumped oi in the pond they did and nearly throttled i tis a blamed shame he had sipped huge tankards of hot ale until he felt thoroughly warm and was steaming now like a great loaf just out of the oven dumped ye in the pond laughed mistress betty you were no beauty before jock miggs but now oh gemini why what had you done i'd done nowt retorted the bewildered shepherd a foine gentleman he took a fancy to me old smock he did he put a pistol to my head then he give me his own beautiful coat for to make me look decent and i were just puttin it on when them soldiers fell on me and nigh throttled me and clapped me in the pound they did ye seem to have had a rough time of it friend miggs said john stitch kindly ay that be so commented jock vaguely mazing times these be they mistook you in your fine clothes for bow brocade explained one of the villagers maybe so quoth miggs i dunno but mistress betty held up a rosy finger at the unfortunate shepherd and said with grave severity ye are not bow brocade jock miggs are ye i dunno replied jock miggs with imperturbable vagueness i don't rightly know who oi be i think them soldiers made a mistake but i don't know he was undoubtedly the hero of the hour and the rest of his morning was spent in pleasant conviviality with all his friends in the village until by about noon the worthy shepherd was really hopelessly at sea as to who he really was at one o'clock he became quite convinced that he was bow brocade the highwayman or at any rate a very dangerous character and had only escaped hanging through his reputation of supernatural cunning and bravery the sergeant and soldiers were drowning their acute disappointment in the bar parlor of the royal george they certainly were not in luck for even at the very moment when egged on by the sergeant they were planning a fresh battue of the heath there came into brassington an advance guard from the duke of cumberland with the news that his royal highness would pass through the village with his army corps on his way to the north the sergeant was requisitioned to arrange for his highness's quarters at the royal george the men would not be allowed to go hunting after a highwayman in case their officers had need of them for other purposes all thoughts of a fresh hunt after their elusive quarry would therefore have to be abandoned until after the army had passed through brassington and sergeant and soldiers could but hope that they would be left behind in order that they might make one more gigantic attempt to earn the hundred guineas reward offered for the capture of bow brocade End of chapter 32
Chapter Thirty Three of Bow Brocade by Baroness Emma Orksey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Awakening john stitch could scarce contain himself for joy fate indeed and all the angels in heaven had ranged themselves on the side of his captain that beau brocade should have emerged unconquered after all out of the terrible position in which he was placed last night seemed to the worthy smith nothing short of miraculous and only accomplished through the special agency of heaven whose most cherished child the gallant highwayman most undoubtedly was in his friend's enthusiastic estimation for the moment therefore the kindly smith felt tolerably happy about his friend the presence of his royal highness the duke of cumberland with his army corps in this part of the country would do much towards keeping the sergeant and soldier's attention away from the heath at any rate for a day or two perhaps the squad now quartered at brassington would be drafted to one of the regiments and a fresh contingent composed of men who'd have no special bone to pick with the highwaymen left behind for this still active hunt against the rebels but this train of thought brought the faithful smith's mind back to the earl of stretton and the stolen letters reassured momentarily as to his friend he was still aware of the grave peril which threatened his young lord neither he nor lady patience could conjecture what had become of the letters sir humphrey challoner after his woeful adventure in brassington had condescended to accept squire west's hospitality for the nonce stitch had spied him in the course of the morning walking in the direction of the village in close conversation with his familiar master Mitichip, attorney at law in spite of the momentary respite in his anxiety the smith felt that there lay still the real danger to beau brocade and to lord stretton moreover by now he longed to see his friend and to learn how he'd fared vaguely in his honest heart he feared that the young man had succumbed on the heath to pain and fatigue and mayhap had failed to reach the forge when he saw the entire population of brassington busy with jock miggs and the soldiers intent on the news from the duke of cumberland's advance guard he determined to set out for the crossroads in hopes of finding the captain at the forge he had just crossed the green and turned into the narrow bridle path which led straight to his smithy when he spied a yokel dressed in a long smock and wearing a broad-brimmed hat coming slowly towards him the man was leaning heavily on a thick knotted stick and seemed to be walking with obvious pain and fatigue some unexplainable instinct caused the smith to wait a while until the yokel came a little nearer this corner of the village was quite deserted the laughter of the folk assembled round the royal george could be heard only as a distant echo from across the green the next moment the smith uttered a quickly suppressed cry of astonishment as he recognized bathurst's face underneath the broad-brimmed hat sh 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 whispered the young man hurriedly her ladyship can i see her yes yes replied john whose honest eyes were resting anxiously on his friend's pallid face but you captain you he did not like to formulate the question and bathurst interrupted him quickly i've rested a while at the forge john your mother was an angel and now i want to see her ladyship 
john's honest heart misgave him his friend's fresh young voice sounded hoarse and unnatural there was a restless feverish glitter in his eyes and the slender tapering hand which rested on the stick trembled visibly you ought to be in bed captain he muttered gruffly and well nursed too you are ill i am sufficiently alive friend at any rate to serve lady patience to the end i'll go tell her ladyship said the smith with a sigh say a man from the village would wish to speak with her don't mention my name john she'll not know me i think tis best that she should not and i look a miserable object enough don't i he added with a feeble laugh her ladyship would command you to rest if she knew i don't wish her to know friend said jack smiling in spite of himself at the good fellow's vehemence her tender pity would try to wean me from my purpose which is to serve her with the last breath left in me and now quick john don't worry about me old friend i am only a little tired after that scramble on the heath and the wound that limb of satan dealt me is at times rather troublesome but i am very tough you know all my plans are made and i'll follow you at a little distance beg her ladyship to speak with me in the passage of the inn twould excite too much attention if i went up to her parlour no one'll know me never fear john knew of old how useless it was to argue with the captain once he had set his mind on a definite course of action without further protest therefore and yet with a heavy heart he turned and quickly walked back through the village to the pack-horse followed at some little distance by bathurst in order to arouse as little suspicion as possible it had been necessary for the young earl of stretton to mix from time to time with the servant and the barman of the inn he was supposed to be an additional serving man come to help at the pack-horse in view of her ladyship's unexpected stay there in this out-of-the-way village of brassington no one knew him by sight and he was in comparative safety here until nightfall when he meant to strike up country again for shelter he was standing in the shadow behind the bar when john stitch entered the parlour bearing the message from beau brocade the room was dark and narrow overfilled with heavy clouds of tobacco smoke and with the deafening clamour of loud discussions and exciting narratives carried on by two or three soldiers and some half-dozen villagers over profuse tankards of ale john stitch managed to reach philip's ear without exciting attention the young man at once slipped out of the room in order to tell his sister that a yokel bearing important news would wish to speak with her privately her heart beating with eagerness and apprehension patience hurried down the narrow stairs and in the passage found herself face to face with a man dressed in a long dingy smock and whose features she could not distinguish beneath the broad brim of his hat he raised a respectful hand to his forelock as soon as he was in her ladyship's presence but did not remove his hat you wished to speak with me my man asked lady patience eagerly i have a message for to deliver to lady patience gascoigne said bathurst whose voice hoarse and quavering with fatigue needed no assumption of disguise he kept his head well bent and the passage was very dark patience with her thoughts fixed on the gallant upright figure she had last seen so full of vitality and joy in the little inn parlour upstairs scarce gave more than a passing glance 
to the stooping form leaning heavily on a stick before her yes yes she said impatiently you have a message from whom i don't rightly know my lady a gentleman twas on the heath this morning he gave me this letter for your ladyship burying his tell-tale slender hand well inside the capacious sleeve of jock Miggs' smock bathurst handed patience a note written by himself she took it from him with a glad little cry and when he turned to go she put a restraining hand on his arm wait till i've read the letter she said i may wish to send an answer she unfolded the letter slowly very slowly he standing close beside her and watching the tears gathering in her eyes as she began to read murmuring the words half audibly to herself have no fear i have the letters and with your permission will take them straight to london i have a powerful friend there who will help me to place them before the king and council without delay to carry this safely through it is important that i should not be seen again in brassington as sir humphrey challoner luckily has lost track of me for the moment and i can be at worksworth before nightfall and on my way to london before another dawn your enemy will keep watch on you so i entreat you to stay in brassington so as to engage his attention whilst i go to london with the letters his lordship would be safest i think in the cottage of old widow coggins at aldwark it has been my good fortune to do her some small service she'll befriend his lordship for my sake john stitch will convey him thither as soon as may be i entreat you to be of good cheer a few days will see your brother a free man and rid you for ever of your enemy believe me the plan i have had the honour to set forth is safe and quick and on my knees i beg you to allow me to carry it through in your service she folded the letter and then slipped it into the folds of her gown through the open doorway behind her a ray of sunshine came shyly peeping in framing her graceful figure with a narrow fillet of gold they were alone in the passage and she intent upon the precious letter was taking no notice of him thus he could feast his eyes once more upon his dream his beautiful white rose drooping with the dew the graceful silhouette outlined against the sunlit picture beyond the queenly head with its wealth of soft golden hair bent with rapt attention on the letter which trembled in her hand his whole being ached with mad passionate longing for her his lips burned with a desire to cover her neck and throat with kisses yet he would have knelt on the flagstones before her and worshipped as did the saints before our lady's shrine in his heart was a great joy that he could do her service and a strange wild hope that he might die for her the gentleman who gave you this letter she said with a slight catch in her low melodious voice you saw him he was well how did he look her eyes now were swimming in tears and bathurst had much ado to still the mad beating of his heart and to force his voice to a natural tone lud my lady he said but he was just like any other body i thought not ill no no not that i could see go back to him friend she said with sudden eagerness tell him that he must come to me at once i i would speak with him it required all bathurst's firm strength of will not to betray himself before her the tender pleading in her eyes the gentle womanly sympathy in her voice set all his pulses beating 
but he had made up his mind that she should not know him just then a look a cry might give him away and there was but one chance now to be of useful service to her and that was to take the letters at once to london whilst their joint enemy had for the nonce no thought of him therefore he contrived to say quite stolidly noah noah the gentleman said to oi you can bring a message but the lady mustn't come nigh me she gave a quick little sigh of disappointment then my good fellow she said try to remember tell him tell him i would wish to thank him tell him nay nay she suddenly added pulling a faded white rose from her belt tell him nothing but give him this flower in token that i have received his letter and will act as he bids me you'll remember he dared not trust himself to speak but as she held out the rose to him he took it from her hand and involuntarily his finger-tips came in contact with hers just for a second long enough for the divine magnetism of his great love to pass from him to her she seized hold of his hand for in that one magnetic touch she had recognized him her heart gave a great leap of joy the joy of being near him once more of again feeling the tender grey eyes resting with passionate longing on her face but she uttered neither cry nor word for it was a great silent and godlike moment when at last she understood he had stooped still lower and rested his burning lips upon her cool fingers and upon the rose which she had worn at her breast neither of them spoke for their hearts were in perfect unison their whole being thrilled with the wild jubilant echo of a divine hosanna and around them the legions of god's angels made a rampart of snow-white wings to shut out all the universe from them leaving them alone with their love End of chapter thirty three chapter thirty four of beau brocade by baroness emma orksey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a life for a life that moment was brief as all such great and happy moments are but a few seconds had passed since both her hands had rested in his and he forgot the world in that one kiss upon her fingertips the next instant a fast approaching noise of hurrying footsteps accompanied by much shouting roused them from their dream both through the back and the front door a crowd of excited soldiers had pushed their way into the inn whilst the folk in the bar parlor attracted by the sudden noise pressed out into the narrow passage to see what was happening john stitch foremost amongst these made a rush for patience's side she found herself suddenly pressed back towards the foot of the stairs and face to face with a noisy group of village folk through which the sergeant and some half-dozen soldiers were roughly pushing their way she looked round her helpless and bewildered jack bathurst had disappeared the whole thing had occurred in the brief space of a few seconds even before patience had had time to realize that anything was amiss the narrow staircase at the foot of which she now stood led straight up to the private parlor where philip was even now awaiting her return out of the way you rascals the sergeant was shouting 
whilst elbowing his way through the small group of gaping yokels and pressing forward towards the stairs will your ladyship allow me the privilege of conducting you out of this crowd said a suave voice at patience's elbow sir humphrey challoner closely followed by the obsequious midichip had pushed his way into the inn in the wake of the soldiers and was now standing between her and the crowd bowing very deferentially and offering her his arm to conduct her upstairs but a few moments ago he had heard the startling news that jock miggs had been captured on the heath in mistake for beau brocade as far as sir humphrey could ascertain nothing of importance had been found on the shepherd's person and in a moment he realized that through almost supernatural cunning the highwayman must have succeeded in filching the letters and by now had no doubt once more restored them to lady patience all the scheming the lying the treachery of the past few days had therefore been in vain but sir humphrey challoner was not the man to give up a definite purpose after the first material check to his plans if her ladyship was once more in possession of the letters they must be got away from her again that was all and if that cursed highwayman was still free to-day said death but he'll have to hang on the morrow in the meanwhile philip's momentary safety was a matter of the greatest moment to sir humphrey challoner if that clumsy lout of a sergeant got hold of the lad all sir humphrey's schemes for forcing lady patience's acceptance of his suit by means of the precious letters would necessarily fall to the ground but instinctively patience recoiled from him his suave words his presence near her at this terrible crisis frightened her more effectually than the sergeant's threatening attitude she drew close to john stitch who had interposed his burly figure between the soldiers and the foot of the stairs out of the way john stitch shouted the sergeant peremptorily this is not your forge remember and by god i'll not be tricked again those are her ladyship's private rooms retorted the smith without yielding one inch of the ground landlord he shouted at the top of his voice i call upon you to protect her ladyship from these ruffians you insult his majesty's uniform quoth the sergeant briefly and do yourself no good smith as for the landlord of this inn he interferes tween me and my duty at his peril by what right do you interfere with me master sergeant here interposed lady patience trying to assume an indifferent air of calm haughtiness do you know who i am ay that i do my lady responded the sergeant gruffly and that's what's brought me here this morning not half an hour ago i heard that lady patience gascoigne was staying at the pack-horse and now the folks say that a new serving-man came to give a helping hand here he arrived in the middle of the night it seems strange time for a serving-man to turn up ain't it i know nothing of any servant at this inn and i order you at once to withdraw your men and not to dare further to molest me your pardon my lady but my orders is my orders i have been sent here by his royal highness the duke of cumberland himself to hunt out all the rebels who are in hiding in these parts i've strict orders to be on the lookout for philip james gascoigne earl of stretton who i understand is your ladyship's own brother and as i've a right of search i mean to see who else is staying in those rooms upstairs besides your ladyship 
this is an outrage sergeant maybe my lady he retorted dryly but with us soldiers orders is orders saving your presence i was tricked at the smithy and again on the heath my belief is that we were hunting a bogey last night there may or mayn't be any highwayman called beau brocade but there was a fine young gallant at the forge the day afore yesterday who did for me and my men and i'll take my oath that he was none other than the rebel philip gascoigne earl of stretton tis false and you talk like a madman sergeant maybe but your ladyship will please stand aside until i've searched those rooms upstairs or i'll have to order my men to lay hands on your ladyship now then john stitch stand aside in the name of the king john stitch did not move and lady patience still stood defiant and haughty at the foot of the stairs the villagers stolid and stupid were staring open-mouthed not daring to interfere but of course it was only a question of seconds the worthy smith could not guard the staircase for long against the sergeant and a dozen soldiers and in any case nothing would be of any avail philip in the room upstairs was trapped like a fox in its lair and nothing could save him now from falling into the soldier's hands in vain she sought for bathurst among the crowd with wild unreasoning agony she longed for him in this moment of her greatest need and he was not there she felt sure that if only he were near her he would think of something do something to avert the appalling catastrophe i give your ladyship one minute's time to stand quietly aside said the sergeant roughly after that i give my men orders to lay hands on you and on any one who dares to interfere give me the letters whispered sir humphrey challoner insinuatingly in her ear i can yet save your brother how she murmured involuntarily he looked up towards the top of the stairs then he is up there she did not reply it was useless to deny it the next few moments would bring the inevitable stand back sergeant quoth john stitch defiantly i have the honour to protect her ladyship's person against any outrage from you good words smith retorted the sergeant but i tell ye i've been tricked twice by you and i mean to know the reason why let her ladyship allow me to search the room upstairs and i'll not lay hands on her ye shall not pass repeated the smith obstinately the letters whispered sir humphrey give me the letters and i pledge you my honour that i can save him yet but half mad with terror and misery scornful defiant she turned on him your honour she said with infinite contempt but in her inmost heart she murmured in agonised despair what's to be done oh god protect him stand back john stitch repeated the sergeant for the third time or i give my men the order to charge now then my men ye shall not pass was the smith's persistent obstinate answer to the challenge forward shouted the soldier in a loud voice into it my men use your bayonets if any one interferes with ye the soldiers nothing loth were ready for the attack there had already been too much parleying to suit their taste they had been baffled too often in the last few days to be in the mood to dally with a woman be she her ladyship or no with a loud cry they made a dash for the stairway which behind stitch and lady patience lost itself in the gloom above 
it was from out this darkness that at this moment a light-hearted fresh young voice struck upon the astonished ears of all those present nay too much zeal friend stitch stand aside i pray you faith it'll give me great pleasure to converse with these gallant lobsters and jack bathurst pushing the bewildered smith gently to one side came down the stairs with a smile upon his face calm debonair dressed as for a feast he had discarded jock miggs long smock broad-brimmed hat and kerchief and appeared in all the gorgeous finery of the beautiful lavender scented clothes he had donned at the forge with the kindly aid of mistress stitch he was still very pale and there were a few lines of weariness and of bodily pain round the firm sensitive mouth but his grey eyes deep sunk and magnetic glowed with the keen fire of intense excitement the coat of fine blue cloth set off his tall trim figure to perfection his left hand was tucked into the opening of his exquisitely embroidered waistcoat and dainty ruffles of delicate mechlin lace adorned his neckcloth and wrists as he appeared there handsome foppish and smiling twas no wonder that the countryside had nicknamed him beau brocade well my gallant friend he said addressing the sergeant since the latter seemed too astonished to speak what is it you want with me eh the sergeant was gradually recovering his breath fate apparently was playing into his hands it was almost too bewildering for any bluff soldier to realize but it certainly seemed pretty clear that the rebel earl of stretton and beau brocade the highwayman were one and the same person you are philip gascoigne earl of stretton he asked at last faith you've guessed that have you responded bathurst gaily odds life tis marvellous how much penetration lies hidden beneath that becoming coat of yours then philip gascoigne earl of stretton you are attainted by parliament for high treason and i arrest you in the name of the king there were indeed many conflicting emotions raging in the hearts of all those present whilst this brief colloquy was going on john stitch accustomed to implicit obedience where his captain's actions were concerned had not dared to speak or stir sir humphrey challoner completely thrown off his mental balance by the unexpected appearance of bathurst was hastily trying to make up his bewildered mind as to what was now best to be done as to patience herself at first a great an overwhelming joy and pride had seized her at the thought that he was near her now that he had not deserted her in the hour of her greatest need that once again he had interposed his magnetic powerful personality between her and the danger which threatened her and philip it was only when the sergeant's momentous words i arrest you in the name of the king rang out clearly and decisively above the loud tumult which was beating in her heart that she became aware of the deadly peril which threatened the man she loved true he had come once more between her and danger but once again he had done it at risk of his life and was like at last to lay it down for her she had been standing a little to one side turning as all had done toward the elegant foppish figure in the fine clothes and dainty ruffles of lace but now she stepped forward with mad unreasoning impulse thrusting herself between him and the sergeant and trying to shield him behind the folds of her cloak 
no 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 she said excitedly sergeant tis all a mistake i swear but already jack bathurst had bent forward and had contrived to whisper unheard by all save her hush sh your brother remember his danger your pardon lady said the sergeant seeing that she paused irresolute not knowing what to do in face of this terrible alternative which was confronting her your pardon lady but this gentleman is philip earl of stretton is he not for your brother's sake whispered bathurst once more no yes oh my god murmured patience in the agony of this appalling misery her brother or the man she loved one or the other betrayed by one word from her now at this moment with no time to pray to god for help or guidance no chance of giving her own life for both out on you friend said bathurst lightly do you not see her ladyship is upset nay have no fear i'll follow you quietly he added seeing that the sergeant and his soldiers were making a motion to surround him but you'll grant me leave to say farewell to my sister the sergeant could not very well refuse he was at heart a humane man and now that he was sure of this important capture he would have done a good deal to ingratiate himself through little acts of courtesy with lady patience gascoigne however he had no mind to be tricked again and in face of an almost immediate execution for high treason the prisoner seemed extraordinarily self-possessed and cheerful but for her ladyship's obvious despair and sorrow the worthy sergeant might even now have had some misgivings as it was he told off three men to mount the stairs and to stand on guard at the top of them in case the prisoner made a dash that way in the hopes of reaching the roof the sergeant still kept an idea in his mind that some supernatural agency was at work in favor of this extraordinary man who up to now had seemed to bear a charmed life he had the little narrow passage and hall of the inn cleared of the gaping yokels who went off one by one scratching their addled palls wondering what it all meant and who was beau brocade was he the earl of stretton was he the highwayman or some pixie from the heath with power to change himself at will sir humphrey challoner retired within the shadow of the stairway on the whole he preferred to leave the events to shape their own course in one way fate had befriended him whether hanged in his own name or in that of the earl of stretton the highwayman would within the next few hours be safely out of the way and then it would be easier no doubt to obtain possession of the letters once again he too like the sergeant and soldiers felt an instinctive dread of supernatural agency in connection with beau brocade in these days there existed still a deeply rooted belief in witchcraft and the educated classes were not altogether proof against the popular superstitions sir humphrey had a curious intense hatred for the man who had so chivalrously championed lady patience's cause his own love for her was so selfish and lustful that overpowering jealousy formed its chief characteristic he was frantically madly jealous of jack bathurst for with the keen eyes of the scorned suitor he had noted the look of joy and pride in her face when the young man first appeared on the stairs and he alone of all those present knew how to interpret her obvious despair her terrible misery when brought face to face 
with the awful alternative of giving up her brother or the man she loved sir humphrey swore some heavy oaths under his breath at thought of the scorn with which she had rejected him womanlike she had yielded to the blandishments of that thief and proud lady patience gascoigne had fallen in love with a highwayman but now fate meant to be kind to sir humphrey with that chivalrous coxcomb out of the way lady patience would be once more at his mercy philip was still a fugitive under the ban of attainder and the letters could be got hold of once again unless indeed the devil with an army of witches and evil sprites came to the assistance of that rascal beau brocade End of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of beau brocade by baroness emma orksey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah quits hemmed in by a compact little group of soldiers at the foot of the stairs and with three men on guard at the head of it bathurst and patience had but a few minutes in which to live these last brief moments of their love she clung passionately to him throwing aside all the haughty reserve of her own proud nature conquered by her great love a woman only whose very life was bound up in his they shall not take you she moaned in the agony of her despair they shall not i will not let you go and he held her in his arms now savoring with exquisite delight this happiest moment of his life the joy of feeling her tender form clinging to him in passionate sorrow to see the tears gathering in her blue eyes one by one for him and to know that her love her great measureless divine love was at last wholly his but the moments were brief and the sergeant below was already waxing impatient he drew her gently into a dark angle of the stairs up against the banisters and taking the packet of letters from his pocket he pressed them into her hand the letters quick he whispered god guard you and him the letters she murmured mechanically i i can do nothing now but try to see the duke of cumberland before you go to london show him the letters he may be in this village to-day if not you can see him at worksworth he has power to stay execution even if your brother is arrested he might use it if he had seen the letters yes yes she murmured sorrow seemed to have dazed her she did not quite know what she was doing but her left hand closed instinctively over the precious packet then dropped listlessly by her side neither she nor bathurst had perceived a thin attenuated figure hoisting itself monkey-wise over the dark portion of the banisters try and hear what those two are saying sir humphrey had whispered and the attorney obedient and obsequious had made a desperate effort to do as he was bid the staircase was but partially lighted by a glimmer of daylight which came slanting round the corner from the passage the banisters were in complete shadow and the sergeant and soldiers were too intent on watching their prisoner to notice master mitichip or sir humphrey the next moment patience felt a terrific wrench on all her fingers even as she uttered a cry of pain and alarm the packet of letters was torn out of her hand from behind and she was dimly conscious of a dark figure 
clambering over the banisters and disappearing into the darkness below but with a mad cry of rage jack bathurst had bounded after that retreating figure wholly taken by surprise he only saw the dim outline of midichip's attenuated form as the latter hastily dropped the packet of letters at sir humphrey challoner's feet who stooped to pick them up like an infuriated wild beast jack fell on sir humphrey you limb of satan he gasped you you give me back those letters stitch stitch quick the force of the impact had thrown both men to the ground bathurst was gripping his antagonist by the throat with fingers of steel but already the sergeant and his men had come to the rescue dragging jack away from the prostrate figure of sir humphrey whilst the soldiers from above had run down and were forcibly keeping john stitch in check freed from his powerful antagonist his honour quietly picked himself up readjusted his crumpled neckcloth and flicked the dust from off his coat he was calmly thrusting the packet of letters in his pocket whilst the sergeant was giving orders to his men to bind their prisoner securely if he offered further resistance sergeant said bathurst despairingly that miscreant has just stolen some letters belonging to her ladyship silence prisoner commented the sergeant you do yourself no good by this violence it seemed as if fate meant to underline this terrible situation with a final stroke of her ironical pen for just then the quiet village street beyond suddenly came alive with repeated joyous shouts and noise of tramping feet in a moment the dull monotonous air of brassington was filled with a magnetic excitement which seemed to pervade all its inhabitants at once and even penetrated within the small dingy inn where the last act of a momentous drama was at this moment being played it must be the duke of cumberland's army quoth the sergeant straining his ears to catch the sound of a fast approaching cavalcade then you'll please his royal highness with the smart capture you've made sergeant said sir humphrey with easy condescension this was indeed fate's most bitter irony the duke has power to stay execution and would use it if you showed him the letters these were the last words of counsel bathurst had given patience and now with freedom for her brother almost within her grasp she was powerless to do aught to save him the letters sir humphrey she murmured imploringly and you've a spark of honour left in you nay he retorted under his breath with truly savage triumph and you don't close your lover's mouth i'll hand your brother over to these soldiers too and then destroy the letters before your eyes he turned and for a moment regarded with an almost devilish sneer the spectacle of his enemy rendered helpless at last bathurst like some fettered lion caught in a trap was still making frantic efforts to free himself until a violent wrench on his wounded shoulder threw him half unconscious on his knees ha 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 laughed sir humphrey i think my chivalrous friend you and i are even at last come prisoner you'd best follow me quietly now said the sergeant touched in spite of himself by patience's terrible sorrow but at sir humphrey's final taunt 
jack bathurst had shaken off the deadly feeling of sickness which was beginning to conquer him he threw back his head and with the help of the soldiers struggled again to his feet the clamour outside was beginning to be louder and more continuous through it all came the inspiriting sound of a fast approaching regimental band the duke of cumberland is it sergeant he said suddenly marching through the village on his way to the north assented the sergeant now then prisoner nay then sergeant shouted jack in a loud voice as wrenching his right arm from the grasp of the soldier who held him he pointed to sir humphrey challoner detain that man and i am the rebel earl of stretton he was my accomplice and has all the papers relating to our great conspiracy at this moment about his person the door the door he added excitedly take care he'll escape you and he has papers on him now that would astonish the king instinctively the soldiers had rushed for both the doorways and when sir humphrey with a shrug of the shoulders made a movement as if to go the sergeant barred the way and said one moment sir you would dare retorted sir humphrey haughtily are you such a consummate fool as not to see that that man is raving mad search him sergeant continued bathurst excitedly you'll find the truth of what i say search him her ladyship knows he was my accomplice search him the loss of those papers would cost you your stripes the sergeant was not a little perplexed already the day before the seizure of sir humphrey challoner's person had been attended with disastrous consequences for the beadle of brassington and now no doubt the sergeant would never have ventured but the near approach of the duke of cumberland's army and of his own superior officers gave the worthy soldier a certain amount of confidence he had full rights and powers of search and had been sent to this part of the country to hunt for rebels he had been tricked and hoodwinked more often than he cared to remember and he knew that his superior officers would never blame him for following up a clue even if thereby he was somewhat overstepping his powers the papers continued bathurst the papers which will prove his guilt the papers or he'll destroy them the sergeant gave a last look at his prisoner he seemed secure enough guarded by three men who were even now strapping his hands behind his back the accusation therefore could be no trick to save his own skin and who knows if the earl of stretton was a rebel lord then why not the squire of hardington seize him and search him commanded the sergeant in the name of the king your pardon sir he added deferentially but the duke of cumberland is within earshot almost and i should be cashiered if i neglected my duty this is an outrage cried sir humphrey who had become purple with rage it's doing your honour no harm and if i've done wrong no doubt i shall be punished search him my men it was sir humphrey's turn now to be helpless in the hands of the soldiers he knew quite well that the sergeant was within his duty and would certainly not get punished for this worse outrages than this attempt on his august person had been committed in the midlands on important personages on women and even children during this terrible campaign against fugitive rebels less than five seconds had elapsed when the soldier drew the packet of letters from sir humphrey's pocket and handed it to his sergeant they'd best be for his royal highness's own inspection said the latter quietly 
as he slipped them inside his scarlet coat ay for his royal highness quoth jack bathurst in mad wild feverish glee oh now is it that your honour thought you could be even with me what sir humphrey was speechless with the hopelessness of his baffled rage but patience almost hysterical with the intensity of her relief after the terrible suspense which she had just endured had fallen back half fainting against the stairs and murmuring the letters before his royal highness thank god thank god then suddenly she drew herself up and laughing crying joyous happy she flew upstairs shouting philip philip come down come down you are safe end of chapter thirty five chapter thirty six of bow brocade by baroness emma orksey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the agony of parting about half an hour ago when jack bathurst suddenly burst in upon lord stretton in the dingy little parlour upstairs he gave the lad no inkling of what was happening down below he had hastily discarded jock miggs's smock and hat and extracted a solemn promise from philip not to stir from the parlour whatever might be the tumult downstairs then he had left the boy chafing like a wild beast in its cage the heavy oak doors and thick walls of the old-fashioned inn deadened all the sounds from below and bathurst had taken the precaution of locking the door behind him but for this no doubt philip would have broken his word sooner than allow his chivalrous friend once more to risk his life for him as the noise below grew louder and louder stretton became more and more convinced that some such scene as had been enacted a day or two ago at the forge was being repeated in the hall of the pack-horse he tried with all his might to force open the door which held him imprisoned and threw his full weight against it once or twice in a vain endeavour to break the thick oaken panels but the old door fashioned of stout well-seasoned wood resisted all his efforts whilst the noise he made thereby never reached the ears of the excited throng like a fettered lion he paced up and down the narrow floor of the dingy inn parlour chafing under restraint humiliated at the thought of being unable to join in the fight that was being made for his safety his sister's cry came to him in this agonizing moment like the most joyful the most welcome call to arms the door quick he shouted as loudly as he could it is locked she found the bolt and tore open the door and the next instant he was running downstairs closely followed by patience the sergeant and soldiers had been not a little puzzled at hearing her ladyship suddenly calling in mad exultation on her brother whom they believed they were even now holding prisoner the appearance of philip at the foot of the stairs and dressed in a serving man's suit further enhanced their bewilderment but already patience stood proud defiant and almost feverish in her excitement confronting the astonished group of soldiers this sergeant she said taking hold of her brother's hand is philip gascoigne earl of stretton my brother arrest him if you wish he surrenders to you willingly but i call upon you 
to let your prisoner go free the sergeant was sorely perplexed the affair was certainly getting too complicated for his stolid unimaginative brain he would have given much to relinquish command of this puzzling business altogether then you sir he said addressing philip you are the earl of stretton i am philip james gascoigne earl of stretton your prisoner sergeant replied the lad proudly but then saving your ladyship's presence said the soldier in hopeless bewilderment who the devil is my prisoner surely sergeant quoth sir humphrey with a malicious sneer you've guessed that already jack bathurst exhausted and faint after his long fight and victory had listened motionless and silent to what was going on around him with the letters safely bestowed in the sergeant's wallet and about to be placed before his royal highness the duke of cumberland himself he felt that indeed his task was accomplished fate had allowed him the infinite happiness of having served his beautiful white rose to some purpose philip now would be practically safe what happened to himself after that he cared but little at sound of sir humphrey's malicious taunt an amused smile played round the corners of his quivering mouth but patience with a rapid movement had interposed herself between sir humphrey and the sergeant your silence sir humphrey she commanded excitedly and you've any chivalry left in you ay he replied in her ear my silence now at a price name it your hand so low and quick had been questions and answers that the bewildered sergeant and his soldiers had not succeeded in catching the meaning of the words but sir humphrey's final eager whisper your hand reached jack bathurst's sensitive ear the look too in the squire of hardington's face had already enabled him to guess the purport of the brief colloquy nay sir humphrey challoner he said loudly but tis not a marketable commodity you are offering to this lady for sale i'll break your silence for you what is the information that you would impart to these gallant lobsters that besides being my mother's son i am also the highwayman beau brocade no 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 protested patience excitedly odds my life quoth the sergeant but methought i beau brocade said sir humphrey with a sneer robber vagabond and thief that's what this gentleman means faith is that what i meant retorted jack bathurst lightly i didn't know it for sure but with a wild cry patience had turned to the sergeant it's a lie sergeant she repeated a lie i tell you this gentleman is my friend my well whichever you are sir quoth the sergeant turning to beau brocade decisively rebel lord or highwayman you are my prisoner and he added roughly for many bitter remembrances of the past two days had surged up in his stolid mind and either way you hang for it i hang for it continued sir humphrey savagely so now methinks my chivalrous young friend that we can cry quits at last and now sergeant said his honour peremptorily that you've found out the true character of your interesting prisoner you can restore me my letters which he caused you to filch from me but the sergeant was not prepared to do that he had been tricked and hoodwinked so often that he would not yield one iota of the advantage which he had contrived to gain your pardon sir he said 
deferentially yet firmly i don't exactly know the rights of that i think i'd best show them to his royal highness and you sir will be good enough to explain yourself before his honour squire west you'll suffer for this insolence sergeant retorted sir humphrey purple with rage i command you to return me those letters and i warn you that if you dare lay hands on me or hinder me in any way i'll have you degraded and publicly whipped along with that ape the beetle but the sergeant merely shrugged his shoulders and ordered off three of his men to surround sir humphrey challoner and to secure his hands if he attempted to resist his honour's wild threats of revenge did not in the least frighten the soldier now that he felt himself on safe ground at last the rapid approach of the army gave him a sense of security he knew that if he had erred through excess of zeal a reprimand would be the only punishment meted out to him whilst he risked being degraded if he neglected his duty whether the squire of hardington had or had not been a party to the late rebellion he neither knew nor cared but certainly he was not going to give up a packet of letters over which there had been so much heated discussion on both sides the fast approaching tumult in the street confirmed him in his resolve he turned a deaf ear to all sir humphrey's protestations and only laughed at his threats already the soldiers were chafing with eagerness to see the entry of his royal highness with his staff the village folk one by one had gone out to see the more joyful proceedings and left the sergeant and his prisoners to continue their animated discussion are you ready my lord asked the sergeant turning to philip quite ready replied the lad cheerfully as he prepared to follow the soldiers he gave his sister a look of joy and hope for he was going to temporary imprisonment only within a few moments perhaps his safety would be assured lady patience gascoigne in virtue of her rank and position could easily obtain an audience of the duke of cumberland and in the meanwhile the letters proving philip's innocence would have been laid before his royal highness no wonder that as the lad marching light-heartedly between two soldiers passed close to jack bathurst he held out his hand to his brave rescuer in gratitude too deep for words are you ready sir quoth the sergeant now as he turned to beaubrocade but here there was no question of either joy or hope no defence no proofs of innocence the daring outlaw had chosen his path in life and being conquered at the last had to pay the extreme penalty which his country demanded of him for having defied its laws as he too prepared to follow the soldiers out into the open patience heedless of the men around her clung passionately despairingly to the man who had sacrificed his brave life in her service and whom she had rewarded with the intensity the magnitude of her love they shall not take you she sobbed throwing her protecting arms round the dearly loved form they shall not they shall not the cry had been so bitter so terribly pathetic in its despair that instinctively the soldiers stood aside awed in spite of their stolid hearts at the majesty of this great sorrow they turned respectfully away leaving a clear space round patience and bathurst thus for a moment he had her all to himself passive in her despair half crazed with her grief clinging to him with all the passionate 
abandonment of her great love for him what tears he whispered gently as with a tender hand he pressed back the graceful drooping head and looked into her eyes one two three four glittering diamonds and for me my sweet dream he added the intensity of his passion causing his low tender voice to quiver in his throat my beautiful white rose but yesterday for one of those glittering tears i'd gladly have endured hell's worst tortures and to-day they flow freely for me why i would not change places with a king your life your brave noble life thus sacrificed for me oh why did i ever cross your path nay my dear he said with an infinity of tenderness and an infinity of joy faith it must have been because god's angels took pity on a poor vagabond and let him get this early glimpse of paradise his fingers wandered lovingly over her soft golden hair he held her close very close to his heart drinking in every line of her exquisite loveliness rendered almost ethereal through the magnitude of her sorrow her eyes shining with passion through her tears the delicate curve of throat and chin the sensitive quivering nostrils the moist lips on which anon he would dare to imprint a kiss and life now to me she whispered twixt heart-broken sobs what will it be how shall i live but in one long memory my life my saint he murmured nay lift your dear face up to me again let me take away as a last memory the radiant vision of your eyes your hair your lips his arms tightened round her her head fell back as if in a swoon she closed her eyes and her soul went out to him in the ecstasy of that first kiss ah tis a lovely dream i dreamt he whispered and tis meet that the awakening shall be only in death he tried to let her go but she clung to him passionately her arms round him in the agony of her despair take me with you she sobbed half fainting i cannot bear it i cannot gently he took hold of both her hands and again and again pressed them to his lips farewell sweet dream he said there dry those lovely tears if you only knew how happy i am you would not mourn for me i have spun the one thread in life which was worth the spinning the thread which binds me to your memory farewell the sergeant stepped forward again it was time to go are you ready sir he asked kindly quite ready sergeant she slid out of his arms her eyes quite dry now her hands pressed to her mouth to smother her screams of misery she watched the soldiers fall into line with their prisoner in their midst and turned to the doorway of the inn through which the golden sunshine came gaily peeping in outside a roll of drums was heard and shouts of the duke the duke the excitement had become electrical his royal highness mounted on a magnificent white charger was making his entry into the village at the head of his general staff and followed at some distance by the bulk of his army corps who would camp on the heath for the night squire west his stiff old spine doubled in two was in attendance on the green holding a parchment in his hand which contained his loyal address and that of the inhabitants of brassington the beetle more pompous than ever and resplendent in blue cloth and gold lace stood immediately behind his honour 
in the midst of all this gaiety and joyful excitement the silent group composed of the soldiers with their three prisoners appeared in strange and melancholy contrast philip and bathurst were to be confined in the court-house under a strong guard pending his honour the squire's decision and as the little squad emerged upon the green twas small wonder that they caught his royal highness's eye he had been somewhat bored by squire west's long-winded harangue and was quite glad of an excuse for cutting it short odds buds he said and what have we here eh the sergeant and soldiers stood still at attention some twenty yards away from the brilliant group of his highness's general staff the little diversion had caused squire west to lose the thread of his speech and much relieved the duke beckoned the sergeant to draw nearer who are your prisoners sergeant queried his highness looking with some interest at the two young men one of whom was a mere lad whilst the other had a strange look of joy and pride in his pale face an air of aloofness and detachment from all his surroundings which puzzled and interested the duke not a little tis a bit difficult to explain your royal highness replied the sergeant making the stiff military salute difficult to explain who your prisoners are laughed the duke incredulously saving your highness's presence responded the sergeant one of these gentlemen is philip gascoigne earl of stretton oh ho the young reprobate rebel who was hand in glove with the pretender i mind his case well sergeant and the capture does your zeal great credit which of your prisoners is the earl of stretton that's just my trouble your royal highness but i hope that these papers will explain and the sergeant drew from his wallet the precious packet of letters and handed them respectfully to the duke what are these letters they were found on the person of that gentleman sir replied the sergeant indicating sir humphrey challoner who stood behind the two younger men silent and sulky and nursing desperate thoughts of revenge he is said to be an accomplice and i thought twas my duty to bring him before a magistrate if i've done wrong you've done quite right sergeant said the duke firmly you were sent here to rid the country of rebels whom an act of parliament has convicted of high treason and it had been gross neglect of duty not to refer such a case to the nearest magistrate give me the papers i'll look through them anon see your prisoners safely under guard then come back to my quarters damnation muttered sir humphrey as he saw the duke take the packet of letters from the sergeant's hand and then turn away to listen to the fag end of squire west's loyal address throughout his chagrin however the squire of hardington was able to gloat over one comforting idea he had now lost all chance of pressing his suit on lady patience his actions in the past three days would inevitably cause her to look upon him with utter hatred and contempt but the man who was the cause of his failure the chivalrous and meddlesome highwayman beau brocade would as sure as the sun would set this night dangle on the nearest gibbet to-morrow end of chapter thirty six chapter thirty seven of beau brocade by baroness emma orksey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah reparation it was in the middle of the afternoon 
when his royal highness having attended to other important affairs and partaken of a hasty meal at the royal george finally found leisure to look through the letters handed up to him by the sergeant as he read one through and then the other lord lovett's letter urging the earl of stretton to join the rebellion that of kilmarnock upbraiding the lad for holding aloof and finally the autograph of charles edward himself at the end of a long string of reproaches calling philip a traitor for his loyalty to king george there has been a terrible blunder here quoth his royal highness emphatically bring the earl of stretton to me at once he added speaking to his orderly ten minutes later philip with patience by his side was in the presence of the duke of cumberland who on behalf of his country and its government was tendering apologies to the earl of stretton for grievous blunders committed it seems you have suffered unjustly my lord said his highness with easy graciousness it will be my privilege to keep you under my personal protection until these letters have been placed before the king and council i myself will guarantee your brother's safety lady patience he added turning with a genial smile to her you will entrust him to my care will you not your father and i were old friends you know in my young days i had the pleasure of staying at stretton hall and the privilege of dandling you on my knees for you were quite a baby then i little thought i should have the honour of being of service to you in later years with courtly gallantry the duke raised her cold fingertips to his lips he looked at her keenly for he could not understand the almost dead look of hopeless misery in her face which she bravely but all in vain tried to hide from him evidently she was quite unable to speak when her brother had been brought before his highness she had begged for and easily obtained the favour of being present at the interview but even at the duke's most genial and encouraging words she had not smiled it was lucky added his royal highness kindly patting her hand that so strange a fate should have placed these letters in my hand but at these gentle almost fatherly words patience's self-control entirely gave way with a heart-broken sob she threw herself at the duke's feet nay not fate your royal highness she moaned but the devotion of a brave man who has sacrificed his life to save my brother and me save him your highness save him he is noble brave loyal and you are powerful save him save him it was impossible to listen unmoved to the heart-rending sorrow expressed in this appeal the duke very gently raised her to her feet nay fair lady i pray you rise he said respectfully odds my life but tis not beauty's place to kneel there there he added leading her to a chair and sitting beside her you know how to plead a cause will you deign to confide somewhat more fully in your humble servant we owe your family some reparation at any rate and you some compensation for the sorrow you have endured and speaking very low at first then gradually gaining confidence patience began to relate the history of the past few days the treachery of which she had been a victim the heroic self-sacrifice of the man who was about to lay down his life because of his devotion to her and to her cause his highness listened quietly and very attentively 
whilst she wrapped up in the bitter joy of memory lived through these last brief and happy days all over again even before she had finished he had sent word to the sergeant to bring both his other prisoners before him at once sir humphrey and jack bathurst were actually in the room before patience had quite completed her narrative bathurst ill and pale but with that strange air of aloofness still clinging about his whole person he seemed scarce to live for his mind was far away in the land of dreams dwelling on that last exquisite memory of his beautiful white rose lying passive in his arms the memory of that first and last divinely passionate kiss the duke looked up when the prisoners entered the room although he knew neither of them by sight he had no need to ask whose cause the beautiful girl beside him had been pleading so earnestly what do you wish to say sir he said addressing sir humphrey challoner first you are no doubt aware of her ladyship's grievances against you they are outside my province and unfortunately outside the province of our country's justice but i would wish to know why you should have pursued the earl of stretton and that gentleman your fellow prisoner with so much hatred and malice i have neither hatred nor malice against the earl of stretton replied sir humphrey with a shrug of the shoulders but no doubt her ladyship would wish to arouse your royal highness's sympathy for a notorious scoundrel that gentleman is none other than beau brocade the most noted footpad and most consummate thief that ever haunted brassing moor the duke of cumberland looked with some surprise not altogether unmixed with kindliness at the slim youthful figure of the most notorious highwayman in england he felt all a soldier's keen delight in the proud bearing of the man the straight clean limbs the upright gallant carriage of the head which neither physical pain nor adverse circumstances had taught how to bend then he remembered lady patience's enthusiastic narrative and said smiling indulgently odds my life but i did not know gentlemen of the road were so chivalrous your royal highness continued sir humphrey silence sir then the duke rose from his chair and went up close to bathurst who half dreaming had listened to all that was going on around him but had scarce heard for he was looking at patience and thinking only of her your name sir asked the duke very kindly for the look of love akin to worship which illumined jack bathurst's face had made a strong appeal to his own manly heart jack bathurst replied the young man almost mechanically and rousing himself with an effort in response to the duke's kind words formerly captain in the white dragoons bathurst bathurst repeated the duke not a little puzzled ah yes he added after a slight pause who was condemned and cashiered for striking his superior officer after a quarrel the same your royal highness twas colonel otway who we found out afterwards was a scoundrel a liar and a cheat said his highness with sudden eager enthusiasm and fully deserving the punishment you sir had been brave enough to give him ay he deserved all he got replied jack with a wistful sigh and smile i'll take my oath of that but i remember now continued the duke a tardy reparation was to have been offered you sir but you were nowhere to be found 
i'd become a scoundrel myself by then and moneyless friendless disgraced and taken to the road like many another broken gentleman then take to the field now man exclaimed his highness gaily we want good soldiers and gallant gentlemen such as you and your country still owes you reparation you shall come with me and in the glorious future which i predict for you england shall forget your past he extended a kindly hand to bathurst who still dreaming still not quite realizing what had happened instinctively bent the knee in gratitude End of chapter thirty seven chapter thirty eight of bow brocade by baroness emma orksey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the joy of reunion on the green outside the crowd of village folk were shouting themselves hoarse three cheers for the duke of cumberland already the news had gone the round that beau brocade the highwayman had been granted a special pardon by his royal highness john stitch half crazy with joy was tossing his cap in the air and in the fullness of his heart was stealing a few kisses from mistress betty's pretty mouth the appearance of sir humphrey challoner in the porch of the royal george looking as black as thunder and followed by his obsequious familiar master midichip was the signal for much merriment and some quickly suppressed chaff stand aside you fool quoth sir humphrey pushing jock meggs roughly out of his way nay stand aside all of ye admonished john stitch solemnly and mind if any of ye have got any turnips about be guy the squire of hardington raised his riding crop menacingly you dare he muttered but mistress betty interposed her pretty person twixt her lover and his honour's wrath saving your presence sir she said pertly my intent was only going to tell the lads to keep their turnips for this old scarecrow and laughing all over her dimpled little face she pointed to master midichip who was clinging terrified to sir humphrey's coat-tails sir humphrey he murmured anxiously as betty's sally was received with a salvo of applause good sir humphrey do not let them harm me i've served you faithfully you've served me like a fool quoth sir humphrey savagely shaking himself free from the mealy-mouthed attorney damn you he added as he walked quickly out of the crowd and across the green don't yap at my heels like a frightened cur god speed your honour shouted stitch after him think you john he'll come to our wedding murmured betty saucily at which honest john hugged her with all his might before the entire company be guy i marvel if the old fox will go to her ladyship's and the captain's wedding eh lordy lordy these be mazing times commented jock miggs vaguely but within the small parlour of the royal george all this noise and gaiety only came as a faint merry echo his royal highness had gone followed by the sergeant and soldiers and bathurst was alone with his beautiful white rose and tis to you i owe my life he whispered for the twentieth time as kneeling at her feet he buried his head in the folds of her gown i have done so little she murmured one poor prayer when you had done so much and now he said looking straight into the exquisite depths of her blue eyes now you have robbed me of one great happiness which may never come to me again 
robbed you of happiness the happiness of dying for you but she looked down at him smiling now through a mist of happy tears nay sir she whispered and when the duke has no longer need of you will you not live for me he folded her in his arms and held her closely very closely to his strong brave heart always at your feet he murmured passionately and as your humble slave my dream and as his lips sought hers once more she whispered under her breath my husband my dream my wife outside the crowd of villagers were shouting lustily three cheers for the duke of cumberland end of chapter thirty eight end of bow brocade by baroness emma orksey